Good morning, Good morning church. church. Welcome, Welcome to, the to the community, community chapel. chapel. Thank, Thank you for joining, joining us on, on Facebook. Facebook. We can't, we can't be, together be together physically, physically but we, we can, can join, join our, our, our hearts together, together in, spirit. in spirit. We're reminded, We're reminded that, that um, and, it's and it's reminded, reminded for, for community, community chapel, chapel. You're, you're new to us. us. You may, you not, may know not know that we've, we've for, for, for more than 30 years, we've met in a high school cafeteria. And so we know that church is not not a building building. it's It's people people. and we're reminded of that in this time so thank you for joining us thank you for being here make yourselves comfortable get a cup of coffee Luke 19 says this Jesus sent two of the disciples saying go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those two were sent away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near... Already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Join us this morning as we sing a few songs of praise to our Lord. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the little children sing, through pillar, court, and temple, the lovely anthem rang, to Jesus who had blessed them, was folded to his breast, the children sang his continue in Luke 19, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Thank you. 
and crown him a king of kings. He mends our hearts, he keeps our ways, lights our minds, and he leads our days all for his glory. to you. For some of you, you may already know this, and for some of you, it's going to be new. But I want you to remember as we sing this song, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in you. Alone in my sorrow and dead to my sin Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom you faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace so free washes over. Rejoiced as though heaven had gone. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in That when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over.
Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And if you're standing at home, you can, you can be seated now. <clears throat> Refill your coffee. <laughs> and let us continue our time of worship this morning by prayerfully considering what our tithes and offerings are to be. Please note that no one, especially God, expects us to give what we don't have. And certainly we are in a time of economic turmoil. It is important to note from Leviticus 27 that everything not only belongs to the Lord, everything is holy to him. And Psalm 96 notes that bringing an offering is part of ascribing to God the glory due his name. So let's spend some moments working through that with our Lord. The information about giving can be found at communitychapel.org forward slash giving. And church members, please consider bolstering our benevolent fund as there may be financial need in our congregation in the near future. Thank you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here. everyone. It's great to have you be a part of our, uh, our worship time today. And uh, I, I do look forward. I'm, I'm talking to a relatively empty room right now and look forward when this room is full again with, with worshipers of God. But today you're worshiping from home and now I invite you to a time of prayer. And as we do here at Community Chapel, we want to pray in those three directions of upward, inward, and outward. So I'm going to begin with Psalm 113, which says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Our God, you are an awesome God. And we are reminded of how powerful and awesome you are when we are reminded of how weak and humble we are as we go through this, uh, this uh, situation, the COVID-19 crisis. Father, you are an awesome God, a powerful God, and so we come before you and praise and honor you and worship you and adore you. And when we read those words about the greatness of God, we are reminded of how small and vulnerable we are. And so we confess, Lord, that we are anxious about our future and weary of our present. So we come to you with our anxieties, our anxieties about our finances, our anxieties about uh, going a little bit, having cabin fever, not being able to do the things we normally enjoy doing, especially this time of year when it's time of, of spring, when we usually come out of our cocoon and hit into the world and, and we're locked in right now. And so, Father, we, we are feeling things that are unusual. And so we call on you, the God of all comfort, the God of all peace, to minister to us. And we want to, at this point in time, give you who are watching and who are here the opportunity to, as Scripture tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7, to cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Please take a moment to do that. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that we're not going through this alone. 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in this story with us, giving us all we need. Help us to lean in to that and all that that means. And Father, as we pray in the outward direction, we pray that you would mercifully bring an end to the spread of this virus. We pray that by the power of God that we believe in and trust in, that you would stop this virus. But we also acknowledge that you are doing amazing things through this virus in our lives as we are being set aside and quieted and stilled. We're learning to lean on you in ways that we might not have have learned otherwise. Father, we pray for comfort for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for healing for those afflicted with the virus. We pray for our doctors and nurses and medical personnel who are treating the sick, sometimes exhausted and weary, their resources just at a limit. Father, we pray that you would meet them and give them strength and encouragement. We pray that you would give them all they need, the endurance they need to continue on in in this work. And Father, we pray for those who are in laboratories right now, researching, uh, doing experiments, trying to figure out what the cure is and what the vaccine would be for this. We pray that you would give them uh, just expedience and wisdom beyond what they can imagine. We pray for our leaders, for our president, for governors, for local leaders who are making decisions right now about us and how uh, how we are to manage through this, that you would give these individuals wisdom and may you guide their, their understanding as well. We pray for protection for all of us against the virus, that we would take the necessary precautions that we're being instructed to take and that you would protect us as we try to do our lives in this situation. And Father, I pray for those who are impacted economically by this, and that's probably that circle's growing wider and wider with each passing day. People who have been furloughed and laid off are not seeing the income that they saw just a couple months ago. And Father, we pray for your ministry to them, for provision, and for those who have resources to be willing to share with those who don't. And Lord, in that vein, we pray that we as a church, the church who calls on the name of Christ, not just Community Chapel, but churches around the world, would be able to uh, answer the call when the call is presented and do the things that are helpful in this difficult environment. And may you bring relief and hope and encouragement and use us for your glory. And Father, I want to add that uh, for our international workers, for those who are serving you in foreign places and for whom uh, this uh, uh, virus takes on another level of complication in their already complicated lives, uh, we pray that you administer to them and give them strength and patience and encouragement and endurance. And for all who are watching right now, all who are in the, under the sound of my voice, that God, for whatever need is in their life, whether it's physical or spiritual, emotional, that you would show yourself all sufficient because you are. We offer this prayer by faith in your name, Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, you've probably all heard the expression, I don't want to rain on your parade. And what that means is, I don't want to mess up your happy mood with some bad news. And uh, that's a a worthwhile thing to do. But I'm thinking today, because it is the day of triumphal entry, as, as Alan reminded us earlier, as Jesus came down the Mount of Olives into the city of Jerusalem, and the people were cheering for him, and they were all excited. It was a joyful day as they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And just a few verses later, to be quite honest with you, Jesus was sort of reigning on their parade. He was reigning on their parade by bringing everyone back to reality and speaking about his purpose, which was his suffering and death to deliver us from sin. We join the story in John chapter 12 and verse 20, if you want to follow along in your text at home, where some Greek Gentiles approached Philip and Andrew and they said, we would like to see Jesus. You see, Jesus was a famous person at this point in time, and so you almost needed to have an insider, somebody who knew him to make a connection for you. And so Philip and Andrew were the guys, and they came, and they were excited to introduce these Greek Gentiles to Jesus, and when they did, Jesus just didn't seem phased by them at all. He seemed kind of indifferent. He didn't exchange pleasantries 
And I think he was uncharacteristically abrupt at this moment. And I think the reason was because he was very focused on what was happening in his life. And here's what he said in verse 23. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. What did he mean by that? That doesn't sound like a bad thing, does it? Being glorified, that sounds like a positive thing. It's like when the, uh, the uh, athlete wins the most valuable player award or when the star wins the Oscar. That's a, that's a moment of glorification. That sounds okay. And maybe for the people who heard him say that, uh, maybe they thought, wow, we just came down the hill of the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. We waved palm branches. We shouted Hosanna. We were worshiping him and honoring him. And maybe this is it. Maybe when Jesus said these words, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, maybe he was saying, you know what? It's go time. It's go time. We're going to start rocking and rolling. We're going to bring the kingdom of God and the power of heaven's going to be unleashed in the world and, and I'm going to end up on the throne. Maybe that's what they thought. But that's not what Jesus thought. That's not what was going to happen. He was going to be glorified in a way that was out of the ordinary for them, and they weren't ready for what was going to happen, and that's why he carefully explained it to them. For Jesus, being glorified meant that he would face the cross, and he brought that to light in the next verse where he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat fall into the earth, And dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So Jesus uses a homey, agrarian analogy here to tell them this that the glory of Jesus came through surrender. The glory of Jesus came through surrender. Now, we call what happened on this day that we celebrate the day of triumphal entry. That day when Jesus came down the Mount of Olives into the eastern gate of Jerusalem, which prophetically was very significant. That's where the the ruler would come. But it wasn't really a triumphal entry as much as it was surrender. In fact, Jesus was walking in to the lion's mouth. He knew exactly what would happen when he got to Jerusalem. As he walked down the the Mount of Olives, it wasn't a joyful uh, celebration. It was a surrender because Jerusalem was the home of his enemies, the members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling party. I imagine, I mean, think about this way. Jesus could have stayed in Galilee and just hung out with his friends, done some fishing, maybe take a stroll on the Sea of Galilee, just laid low, stay below the radar. But he went right into Jerusalem. He went right into the lion's mouth. Jesus said, John said of Jesus several times, he says uh, that that there were times when Jesus was in a situation and John said, but it's not going to happen yet because his hour had not yet come. His hour had not yet come. And so Jesus says here, well, the hour has come. The hour has come. Back in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, there's a verse that I'm just captivated by where it says, as the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Jesus didn't say, well, guys, I guess it's time we head into Jerusalem. He resolutely set out for Jerusalem. This was something that was important. He knew it was. It was his mission, and he was on point. He resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Back to our agrarian analogy in, in John 12, 24. Uh, it's, seeds can only do what they're supposed to do when you bury them in the ground. When they're buried in the ground, that's when seeds do their work. You don't buy a packet of seeds and just leave them in your kitchen and say, well, eventually they're going to grow. That's not how it works. They grow when you bury them in the ground. A few years ago, I was cleaning my garage and in one of the containers in the garage, I found a a packet of tulip bulbs. And I don't remember when I bought them. I don't remember how long they had been laying in the garage. But I pulled up this packet. It was a net filled with tulip bulbs. And these things were dried and shriveled and dead. Now, I'm a frugal guy, so I figured, why not? I said, I'm either going to throw these in a trash can or bury them in the backyard, and who knows? Maybe something good may come of them, but it didn't. They just were, they were dead. They were too far gone. You see, bulbs and seeds, they must be buried for them to do the thing they're supposed to do, and that's come to life. The way to fruitfulness is through death. 
And Jesus goes on to say that when he speaks to us. Our, Christ's glory came through surrender, and the same is true for us. He said in verse 25, whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And so Jesus pushed this into our lives. It's not just about me, he said. It's also about those who are followers. He challenges his followers to follow his lead and be willing to give their lives away for the kingdom. Bearing our desires, our ambitions, our wishes makes us of greater use in God's kingdom and brings glory to him. And so loving our own lives in terms of what we've acquired, what we've accomplished, all those kind of things, loving that and being possessive of that is a self-defeating proposition. As Leon Morris says, it destroys the very life it seeks to retain. We're trying to hold on to our lives, but by holding on to it, we actually destroy it. The glory of Jesus came through surrender, and, and that's how our glory comes too. The glory of Jesus also came through obedience. He says in verse 27, Now is my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. If his listeners hadn't taken their clue from verse 24, then this verse would have clued them in even more as to what Jesus was experiencing as he was on his path to glory through the cross. Some have suggested that this verse is John's version of Jesus pouring out his heart to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I want to read to you from Mark 14, which is Mark's version, where he says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I'm so sad I could die. And then he says, Abba, which is an Aramaic word meaning very, very, a term of endearment. He says, Abba, Father. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Abba, I'm so sad about this. I'm so crushed. And yet I will do what you want me to do, no matter what. Jesus knew why he had come into the world. He knew what his purpose was. And so how could he have asked to have been saved from that purpose? That's why he was here. As Oswald Chambers says, the cross did not just happen to Jesus. He came on purpose for it. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus knew his destiny. Even though it would be painful and bring sorrow, he knew it. He expressed his feelings, his emotions of being overwhelmed with what he was going through right at that moment. But ultimately, he knew that was his purpose. And that he would obey. Jesus' primary focus was obedience to the Father. And that meant the redemption of those of us who are Christ followers. We are the beneficiaries of his obedience to the Father. There's a worship song that we've done sometimes here at Community Chapel called Above All. And it speaks of uh, Christ's sacrifice for us. Great song. And this one line says these words, Like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me above all. There was a fellow who used to attend our church that had a problem with that idea, that Jesus thought of us above all. And theologically, that is maybe a little bit suspect. And so this individual decided that he would confront the songwriter. He was at a gathering where the songwriter was, and he confronted him about his, well, I suppose, theological deficiencies. He's not sure how that encounter went exactly, but I think it's a legitimate point. Jesus' primary focus was obedience to the Father. And that happened, that led to redemption. We're the beneficiaries of his obedience. But his primary thought when he was dying on the cross was not about you and me. His primary thought was he was obeying the Father. And we are the beneficiaries of that. Jesus says in verse 28, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven uh, came from heaven and said, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The Father gave his affirmation here of Jesus. There are two other times that we know in Scripture that the Father spoke from heaven and affirmed his Son. The first is his baptism, and the second is Jesus' transfiguration. 
when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration and was with Moses and Elijah and was transfigured and became uh, like a heavenly being. And the Father said, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. The glory of Jesus came through obedience to the Father. And so the glory of Jesus came through surrender. It came through obedience. And finally, it came through the fulfillment of his mission. Jesus' mission was not completed at this moment, but it would be soon. In the hours ahead, it would be completed. As Jesus died on the cross, he said seven, had seven expressions, and one of those was when he said, it is finished. It's a Greek word that's translated, it is finished, a Greek word, to telestai, which has a commercial feeling to it. It's like if you pay for something that you've purchased, that means the debt is paid, and, and that's the word that would be used to communicate that. But Jesus gave his life to pay the ransom for our sin. And he completed this grueling assignment. And so he says these words in the next set of verses, 31 through 32. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And when I, I, when I am lifted up, will draw all people to myself. Jesus indicated that there are three parts of his mission here. Three parts of his mission. First of all, the world will be judged. Second, the ruler of this world, meaning Satan, will be cast out. And third, Jesus will draw all people to himself through his death. First of all, let's look at that idea of the world will be judged. John 3, verses 17 and 18 says that Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. But then verse 18 tells us that for people who do not believe in Christ, who do not trust in him, they will be condemned, but their condemnation is self-inflicted. You see, the cross is an indictment on human sin. The cross declares in no uncertain terms that we have missed the mark of God's perfection, which is why Jesus had to die for us. If we had been able to achieve God's righteous standard on our own, the cross would have been unnecessary. But the cross stands in judgment and says, you missed the mark, and your perceived self-righteousness has fallen short. Mm. I remember being at a men's retreat up in New Hampshire, Monadnock, New Hampshire to be exact. And, you know, we were there for a couple of days. And I remember seeing this one gentleman with a T-shirt on. And it had a picture of the cross on it and a slogan that said these words. If I'm okay and you're okay, explain this, meaning the cross. If I'm okay and you're okay, explain the cross. That's something we cannot do because we're not okay. We've fallen short of the glory of God and missed the, missed the mark of his righteousness. And the cross stands in judgment of that. Next, Jesus says, the next part of his mission is that the ruler of this world, Satan, will be cast out. The cross seems to be the point where Satan has won the victory. And again, I'm thinking of that movie, The Passion of the Christ, where that, that figure, that demonic figure that's lurking about during the crucifixion, uh, seems to be all excited and happy because Christ is dying. And then as Christ dies, you realize the tables are turned. Leon Morris says Satan was defeated in what appeared outwardly to be the very moment of his triumph. This seemed to be his victory. And yet it was his ultimate defeat. Satan is powerful in this world, and we all know that. We've all experienced that. But in the world to come, he's not only powerless... He's non-existent because Satan has been defeated. Third thing about Jesus' mission is it says he will draw all people to himself through his death. Reconciliation with God is only possible through the death of Jesus Christ. And I think about those Greek Gentiles who were standing there and who had had kind of a, an abrupt interaction with Jesus. In fact, not really any interaction at all. But they heard him say, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And they knew they were part of the all people because they were seekers. They were searching for Jesus. They wanted to, to know Jesus and find out about him. John 1 verse 12 says, To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. One of my favorite Christian musicians uh, is Rich Mullen. He's been dead over 20 years now. He died in 1997 in a car accident. And his last album was, was developed posthumously by his group, the Ragamuffin Band. 
And one of the songs that I've been listening to quite a lot lately is All the Way to Kingdom Come. And here are the lyrics that I wanted to share with you. We didn't know what love was till he came. And he gave love a face and he gave love a name. And he gave love away like the sky gives the rain and sun. We were looking for heroes. He came looking for the lost. We were searching for glory. And he showed us a cross. Now we know what love is because he loved us all the way to kingdom come. I like that line. We were searching for glory. And he showed us a cross. Because that's how Christ experienced God's glory. To the human beings around, the cross of Christ was a symbol of shame and defeat. To Christ, it was the glory of his mission being accomplished. This last week, I tuned the TV into a program I really enjoy. It's Ken Burns' miniseries on baseball. And it kind of goes through the history of baseball. Since there's no you know, real baseball to watch right now, I tuned into that. And it was a segment on Babe Ruth. And Babe Ruth, of course, even people that don't like baseball know that name. One of the greatest baseball players of all times, a very popular person, the home run king for many, many years until I think it was 1974 when Hank Aaron broke his record. He made the New York Yankees great. In fact, the old Yankee Stadium was called the the house that Ruth built. And this man lived large. He made a lot of money and he spent a lot of money. He lived a very indulged and hedonistic lifestyle and had a lot of hangers on, shall we say. But as his talents began to fade, as his health diminished, so did his popularity. So did his glory. And he almost at the end of his life became a pathetic person. It was very, almost sad at the end of his life. In the world, we as people might be looking for glory. And we might attach that to certain things. And we might like the accolades and the recognition and the popularity. And the world's glory lasts just about as long as the source of that glory lasts. So if our looks start to fade as we grow older, if our talents diminish, if our wealth decreases, when those things fade, the glory fades as well. But with Jesus, glory came through surrender. Glory came through obedience. And glory came through the fulfillment of his mission. For Christ's followers, the same is true. God is glorified as we surrender to him. God is glorified as we obey his calling on our lives. God is glorified as we fulfill the mission he's given us to do. So when you hear the spirits prompting you, when you take steps of faith that you know are right, even though they're difficult, then you participate in God's glory. And the joy and fulfillment you experience from those experiences, that's the glory. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came into our world and really redefined what glory was. For us, glory is sort of something on the surface, something temporal that comes and goes. But for you, it's a sign of of your obedience, your surrender, and the fulfillment of your mission. I pray that you would teach us those lessons And help us, God, as we face our lives and the challenges that we experience, that we too would be participating in your glory. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Will you join me as we close with this song? In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. In your church, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In your church, Lord, Be glorified today. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. A couple of announcements. Uh, Again, uh, no public gatherings for the foreseeable future. 
but we encourage you to stay in touch with what's happening uh, via our, in, our email newsletter, In Touch, uh, the website and our Facebook and, and other platforms. And we invite you and hope you'll join us next Sunday for our, our virtual celebration. And uh, we're going to have a great time together, even though we won't be together. We're going to experience God's presence here, and so we just hope you'll join us. Also on Friday, Good Friday, we're going to have a, a, a live streaming uh, of our Good Friday celebration, and that'll be at 5 o'clock on Good Friday afternoon. And again, if you need anything, if you need to just talk to me, uh, if you need any physical things or just want to talk to me and have prayer, please feel free to call the office, and, uh, and I'll, I'd love to be talking with you. God bless you. I hope you have a great week.